Somebody's still watching. Well, I told you this morning, I'm going to Bible study this a little bit as opposed to a straight sermon. Um, I don't preach out of the Psalms very often because they're mostly written as songs or poems. And so I, I get the sense when I read a psalm, particularly if the psalmist is writing it as a prayer or a song um, or a poem and they identify it as such, I, I treat that a little differently as scripture than I do other scripture because the psalms are so beautiful. But this morning, um, we were given as the common lectionary the psalm for this week is the 121st psalm. It's called a song of a sense, of a raising. And so I wanted to, to talk to you about it this morning and I wanted to use some notes because I want to walk through it line by line with you as opposed to um, more of a expository uh, sermon this morning. The, the main thing that I want you to take from this piece of scripture is that the psalmist assures us that those who pray this psalm will not walk alone. That it says the maker of heaven and earth himself is our guardian. So keep that in mind as we read this, that the psalmist is reminding us right away that the person who walks beside us, the person that has our back, is the person that's made all creation. So if he's that awesome, he's the right guy to have in your corner. And so let us read the 121st Psalm. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. So the psalmist sets us up right from the beginning, and he says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. He is going to eventually, in that uh, phraseology, then also tell us that my help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. So he's already painting a picture that the person who is our uh, guide is the person that has made all that we see and know. And us as humans, the most awesome thing, at least I think we can see, at least here on earth, are mountains. Because they're so majestic. And you think about if we gave you a shovel and told you to start shoveling and making a pile, how impossible it would be to make a mountain. And I've told you uh, several times in my motorcycle ridings in the spring and summer, early fall, there is no more beautiful place than Shenandoah Mountain as you go over top of 33 from Virginia to West Virginia. You see the expanse of God's creation. It's beautiful in the summer when it's green. It's beautiful in the fall when it's orange and red in all of its glory. And it's actually beautiful in the winter when there is no foliage because when it snows, it's gorgeous up there. And so when I go there, I look at what is around me and say, there is nobody but the most awesome of awesomes that could make that. And so if that's the case, and I'm told that by the psalmist, we're going to look to the mountains for our source of inspiration, how more inspiring is it than to be on the mountain and look upwards? And so then he goes on into the next uh um, stands up. He says, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. I would argue with you, church, that the most important sleep that there was in the Bible wasn't a good one. 
when Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, why don't you all look out for me while I go over yonder and pray? And when he got back, several of his disciples were asleep. Now, of course, we get that message in the New Testament long after the psalmist has written this, but this is a reminder to us that God is never going to sleep on you. The Lord's never going to close his eyes and let you fall asleep. Even the most fervent of Jesus' followers let him down at a time when Jesus didn't need to be let down. So he won't slumber and he won't sleep and he won't let your foot slip. This slipping that the psalmist is talking of I would ask you to take uh, more um, esoterically than um, in actuality. What I mean by that is, is that if your foundation of your faith is firmly based in and on God and the precious name of Jesus, your foot's not going to slip. Because your foundation is firm. Your foundation is solid. On solid rock I stand. So your foot's not going to slip. When we slip is when we remove ourselves from that solid footing and we go off on our own. You will never falter and you will never fall. You will never slip if you stay where God has put you to complete your purpose in his plan for his people. He's always watching. I have bathroom duty every day. I've had the same bathroom duty now at school for seven, eight years. I have my little chair. I have my little American flag. One day I'm gonna give me a badge. <laughs> But I am the bathroom monitor. And I have a saying. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. So when the kids ask me, Coach, why do you guard the bathroom? I said, so there ain't 80 new clowns in there. And then they said, all right, give us your say. And I said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And now they're starting to figure out what that really means. Some of them, it takes them two or three years, but they get it. We're able to be free because God is always in control and God's always watching. Now, you might say, if someone's always watching, how can you be free? If he's always watching and he has our back, we're free to do what he has called us to do in his kingdom. And with that great freedom comes great promise and great change. You can't go out and do the work of God if you are not free to do so and you don't feel freed up. Well, the only way you can be freed up is if you have somebody that has your back. Our freedom is dependent, church, on God's eternal vigilance. His willingness to watch over us when no one else will or can. And then the psalmist in the third stanza says, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Now, there is this image I want you to think about because he says that the Lord watches over you. He's your shade at your right hand. Where else do we know someone stands at the right hand? Jesus Christ. Is with Christ is with God at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So what he's telling you is, is that your shade, your comfort, your security, he is at your right hand. He's going to provide you what you need at your right hand. So now where if you paint this picture, he is giving you your security, your protection at your right hand, and as you stand at his right hand. You have been doubly covered. So if you look at that imagery, he says, I'm going to put your help at your right hand 
And as long as you stay solidly at my right hand, nothing will harm you or come of you. It also means this, if you look at the imagery, the sun and the moon. You got to remember now, we're back in the times of King David. We're in a biblical sense. And so all we have in terms of things that are big and awesome, right, are things that we can see here on earth and then the planets. Because you got to look up there and go, wow, we can't touch it. So it's got to be pretty big. So the imagery that the psalmist is giving us is, is that no matter how big it is, I've got shade for you when the sun is out. And when you have the moonlight out, I still got you covered day and night, 24-7. And then in the last stanza, the psalmist writes, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. When he says he'll watch over your life, he means all aspects. That means relationships, finances, your health, your family, your faith. One of the things that we got to get comfortable with is that when the Lord is watching over us, we've got to remind ourselves that that doesn't mean it's always going to be a smooth go. we got to remind ourselves that sometimes the blessing is disguised as trouble. Opportunity knocks all the time at your door. The problem it is is it wears work boots and it looks like work. We have to remember sometimes that in our walk with God, in our walk with Jesus, that their rationale and their function in our lives at that time is to glorify themselves and to fulfill what's needed within the body of Christ. And so sometimes that means that someone must suffer for a multitude to be saved. Sometimes it means one of us has to take the butt whooping so that others are spared the rod. Sometimes it takes someone to get cancer so that it can be cured in such a way that the rest of humanity doesn't get it. We have to be mindful of that. I watched the other day on TV um, Jim Valvano. It's one of the most famous speeches you could ever see. And he's talking about cancer. He's talking about cancer research. And one of the things he said is, is that whatever time I have left, I'm going to dedicate to that cause. He knew he didn't have much time left. And he knew he would need a miracle of miracles to change what was going to happen to him. He's a famous basketball coach. One of the funny things during that speech is, is that this guy turned on the clock in the back and he says, 30 seconds left. And he goes, dude, I'm dying. You can take your 30 seconds. I'm going to talk as long as I want. As long as the camera's on, I'll talk because I've got something I need to say and it's something you need to hear. I tell you that to say that in the midst of something that he knew was going to be detrimental to his life. He knew that his suffering might be needed so that they had somebody's body to study so that they might find a cure for specific kinds of cancer that he had. And so when we read this song of ascents, it says very clearly that the maker of heaven and earth has got our back. He's going to watch over us. He's going to take care of us. But don't Take that to mean that it's going to be a bed of roses. Remind yourself that when he is taking care of you, he's taking care of you so that you might walk in his favor and you might fulfill your purpose in the body of Christ. So then you may say, Kim, well, what's my purpose? And I'll say that I would refer you back to all of those things that you have been tied to all along in your life and place them within the context of the church. 
if you are a good carpenter, maybe those gifts could be folded into your ministry, whether it's personal or your church ministry. Maybe your purpose is to build, ah, but not necessarily build a house, but build the body of Christ. You take what you know and, and how you build things and apply that to your work on behalf of Jesus. You might be a, a great orator. You might be a great speaker, but you don't want to preach. Maybe, maybe your talent is to be used to be a motivator for others. Maybe your words and your actions should be such that you get other folks off their butt and they go do ministry. We've got to look at ourselves much differently now as a church where we are in the 21st century. Because we're at a point where people who are broken are looking somewhere for something. And we have to remind ourselves that we are free. We are free because we have God as our backup plan. Don't be afraid to fail in ministry. As long as you're working and you've got your feet firmly planted, he will not let your feet slip. Understand that whether you're working morning, noon, or night, he will never sleep on you. He's never going to walk away and leave you unguarded, leave you unmotivated, leave you undirected. He's always going to be there. And when he keeps you from all harm, understand, church, that it doesn't mean he's going to keep you away from all hurt. And there's the difference. The most important part of this is how it's concluded by the psalmist. The Lord will watch over your comings and goings, both now and forevermore. The forever war part is what we need to be working on. Because there's two types of forever more. And I told you, I'm never going to preach on heaven if we're not willing to accept hell. So you have two choices. We have two jobs to do. We either can stand by and watch as people go to hell truly because they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Or we can take the freedom that we've been given because God has our back and we can work toward introducing them to Jesus in a way that they may receive eternal salvation. Because forevermore, there's two forevermores. And it's binary. There's heaven and hell. There's no purgatory. There's no middle ground. There's no... We'll get back to you in a little bit. When the Lord calls you to judgment, you've got two options. One of them is awesome. The other is awesome in its own right as to the pain and suffering it brings. So remember, church, this. Two things I want you to take away from this psalm is that God's got your back. No matter what you're going through, no matter how painful it is, no matter how traumatic it is, it may hurt, but he won't let it harm you. And secondly, what I want you to take from this is, is that as he watches over you, we have a purpose to fulfill. We have a purpose to fulfill as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a purpose to fulfill as a church. We have a purpose to fulfill as the body of Christ. We have a purpose to fulfill as humanity. And there is no other way that I know of right now that people are going to hear the gospel message of the saving grace of Jesus Christ unless we, the church, proclaim it. And I'm going to leave you with this word. Proclaim. Pro meaning what? It's active. We're going to actively claim people. We're going to act.
actively claim people, proclaim them for the body of Christ. Because that's what we've been called to do, church. Amen?